Welcome back to Dead Good Book Reviews, I'm Judith and you're watching an episode of Overbooked, the series where I talk about every single book on my shelf because otherwise the creepy owl that lives in my wallpaper is going to come out and demand my bones. Today we are talking about Sarah Maria Griffin's Other Words for Smoke. <laughs> I will just very quickly put up, I believe it's the US cover here because they look quite different. These are the same book, we're talking about the same thing, all good. Some quick disclaimers before we start, I bought this book myself, nobody's paying me to talk about books and all opinions are my own. Some content warnings do apply to this book, I would suggest looking them up for yourself, especially if you're sensitive to anything in particular. Don't cry at me. Um, <laughs> Her, not you. You can cry at me all you want. Um, I would say if you're particularly sensitive to somewhat toxic relationship dynamics, that would be something I would maybe look out for in this book. Other Words for Smoke is a YA horror, creepy, eerie, I don't know what genre I would put it under, novel that came out in 2019, which at this point feels like a century ago. I was convinced this book was like 2017 or something. I think part of its success is due to both, it's a very good book, you know, but also I think due to the success of Spare and Found Parts. Why can't I, why does that sound so wrong? I feel like it ought to be Fair and Found Parts or Pair and Sound Farts. That's Sarah Maria Griffin is a poet, author, zine creator based in Dublin. Her other works include Follies in 2011, Not Lost, A Story About Leaving Home in 2013, Spare and Found Parts 2016, and Other Words for Smoke 2019. To give you a plot summary, I feel like we've been having some very appropriately spooky books for this time of year, like it's just cycled around. Clearly all the authors with G as their last name have been killing it in the horror front. I'm going to read you the blurb because I find this book intensely difficult to summarise. The house at the end of the lane burned down and Rita Frost and her teenage ward Bevan were never seen again. The townspeople never learned what happened. Only May and her brother Rossa know the truth. They spent two summers with Rita and Bevan, two of the strangest summers of their lives. Because nothing in that house was as it seemed. A cat who was more than a cat, and a dark power called Sweet James that lurked behind the wallpaper, enthralling Bevan with whispers of neon magic and escape and in the summer heat May became equally as enthralled with Bevan. Desperately, in the grips of first love, she'd give the other girl anything, a dangerous offer when all that sweet James desired was a taste of new flesh. Ba -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. This is why this book is on my list of weird books. That's, that's why that's there, because as you can imagine from that description, this book's pretty odd. One thing I really like about this book, and I talked about it, I did a read-along on my blog when I originally did this, I read it back. It's not worth checking out. Uh, but one of the things I mentioned is the eeriness and creepiness of this book is really powerful. I think that it captures a living in a haunted house in a non-gothic sense really well. That eeriness and creepiness and weirdness is all really good, but one of the reasons it works is it isn't just weird for the sake of being weird. Like there are strange things happening, but there are rules for them and you get to learn some of the rules and you get a sense of what the others might be. It's not here I'm going to describe everything that happened because I think that would probably be fairly boring, but also it's not, this is just weird, accept it, move on with your life, which some things are. Uh, I'm reading Vita Nostra at the moment while I'm filming this and I feel like some of those things are just going to be weird for the sake of weirdness. I just feel that way, I've not finished it yet. So this strangeness is both really creepy and also just makes sense enough that you stay in the book, I guess. This book definitely surprised me as well, particularly when I first read it. I knew that it was somewhat creepy but I bought it off, I think it was Justine's recommendation, I believe, maybe, I'm not sure. And certainly this UK cover, you have this like somewhat, you know, rose goldy, nice cover. You've got pink sprayed edges. It's fun, it's nice. And I think they're trying to evoke the neonness of the story because that is a significant factor. But it does look like it's gonna be much more fun and friendly than the book actually is. And I quite like that as something the book's done. I think it adds to the creepiness of it. Um, I think either cover makes sense with the content, but this one I find quite fun. Even going and knowing what this book is, I think it does still surprise you with some of the places that it goes. And I, I appreciate that. I like a book that's gonna shock and surprise me. Another thing that's always a bit hard to categorize or to, to bring up in these reviews is I feel like the teenagers in this book are realistic teenagers. I feel like the crushes they develop and the feelings they have feel like how it felt for me to be a teenager. I'm just also very aware that I inch ever further away from being a teenager with every passing day. And I don't know whether somebody who felt that way now or is that age now would feel the same, would feel that this was realistic. I think the reason that this works in this case is this is very much a reporting of events that happened in a particular time. It's not trying to be contemporary, which I think is always really interesting. And the kind of huge amount of YA contemporary that's producing now alongside the technology and stuff getting ever faster. I think things seem out of date sooner and I'll be really interested to see how dated YA contemporary becomes 
very quickly. You know, that's a, an aside, a complete aside on my feelings on YA contemporary. But this, what was I saying? It works because it's a particular period of time and I felt like the teenagers felt realistic. Something you might want to bear in mind if you're planning on reading this book is that while there is sapphic representation in the story, we love to see it, uh, it's not a happy story, it's not joyous sapphic representation, which is sad in some ways. I think for me, I've read enough other happy sapphic representation that I'm, I'm okay to read some sadness. Like if we're talking about crossing the breadth and depth of human emotion, we can have some sadness there too. But I think if you want a sapphic romance, this is very much not that. There's not that kind of story. It just has sapphic yearning in it. And I think for me, as somebody who really didn't figure all of that out for myself until I was in a very long-term committed relationship and also a little bit older, I think that it's quite nice to live vicariously through that and experience some of that heartache, albeit in this very surreal setting. Yeah, I don't know, there's there's stuff there. I just don't want to be like, yay, sapphic representation, and then have you read it and be like, oh my goodness, Judith, what are you talking about? If you like a story that answers all of your questions, I do not think you will like this. If you're open to an open-ended kind of thing, I suspect you will enjoy this a little bit more. Some things do get answered. Most things, I would say, are left up to you to kind of conclude based on what you've learned. It's not a long book. We're talking just over 300 pages. Uh, not, not, not a huge amount to go on, but just, yeah, powerful stuff in a small package. But if you like neatly tied off ends, you're not gonna, not gonna get on with this one. Thinking of some other things, some, if you like this, you might like, uh, Haunted House stuff, I always recommend. I'm not gonna pull it down because it's nice and visible behind me. Um, House of Salt and Sorrows by Erin A. Craig is a wonderful haunt haunted house story. Yes, it's good stuff. I've also just finished House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland, which I think has a lot of similarities. This is overtly YA horror. And um, yeah, I'll be talking about this in an upcoming vlog, but I do think that there are some, some crossover elements, some crossover appeal. I think this is a bit more adult, maybe. Hard to say, horror's hard to judge. I thought I'd briefly mention Spare and Found Parts, as I've mentioned it a fair amount in this video. I personally wasn't sold on it. It was a bit too literary for me. I wonder if reading it again, now that I've read more literary fiction, I would feel differently. But at the time, I just remember having quite high expectations and feeling ultimately like I didn't get a lot out of it. Yeah, I, it wasn't for me, but it does exist. And I know a lot of people have really enjoyed it. That's kind of got Frankenstein elements to it. The only other thing I wondered about for this one in terms of, I, I guess, otherworldly places uh, and teenagers, and the complication of being a teenager and feeling like you want to escape and being offered an escape and all of that stuff. Uh, Shannon Maguire's Wayward Children series is a really good one to read and I think it it is completely different in tone a lot of the time but it touches on a lot of the same ideas and I would say that that's always something I would recommend to read anyway. Coming of age is a hard thing to pin down both for yourself and in fiction and I think that this book manages to both realistically depict what it's like to come of age and also depict this completely bizarre, surreal situation that could never happen. It's a complete fantasy. It's very weird. And brings those two together in a really interesting way, while also talking a bit about kind of generational trauma. Um, there's heaps of stuff in this book. The more I think about it, the more things you can pull out. And I think that that would make it a really good book club book pick potentially. I don't know that I want to read it in a book club because I quite like internalizing it all. But if you are a person who likes a bookish discussion and you're looking for something to recommend, this might be one to consider, maybe. I'm not responsible if your book club hates this book. Are there any other creepy-esque books that you like, that you've read, that you've enjoyed, that you would add to my list of weird books? I would always love to hear them. I obviously have my Halloween reading vlog where I talk about House of Hollow and some various other things. That's coming up in a couple of weeks by the time you're watching this. End of, end of October, it'll be up. Um, so I'm excited to talk about things then and keep going with this whole business. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Overbooked. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'm going to go and give my dog pets because she deserves them because she's been nice and quiet for most of this video filming. Thank you, Luna. While you're down there commenting, please do subscribe. It makes me feel loved and appreciated. You can also follow me on social media. Come hang out on Discord. We have wonderful chats there. That's all from me and I will see you in the next one. It's got a piece of bloopers now. It's where I read every single book on my show. Nope, that's not what it is. It's where I read every... Welcome. Here she comes. There she is. Hi. Hello. I have limited battery left. I don't have time to spend it talking about how cute you are, I'm afraid. She just wants to be with me. Do you think you can be non-gross while I film? Would that be okay? Come here. Come here. Come here. We'll go over there. Please don't chew your knees, Luna.
Stop that.